All right, uh, welcome to the Eric J. The Great Podcast Show. We got a special guest on the show today, music artist King Shalik. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. You know, feeling great. You know, I'm in good spirits. Thank you for having me, big bro. All right, no problem. So uh, for everybody out there that haven't uh, heard any of his music, uh, we're going to start off by playing one of his songs, and then we'll get into his whole story. Let's get it. He surprised me with this one, y'all, because I don't know what he's going to play. He said, I got my favorite song. Hey, fool. Hey, hey, hey. It's good. Oh, it's good. 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 Stay pray You know, that song was one of the first songs I recorded after doing eight and a half years after, you know, being wrongfully accused of murder and going to trial twice. That song, you know, was a song I wrote that in prison. You know, you know how you sit into yourself and you just writing and you think. And I'm like, a bro, you know, one of my bros like, yo, that song catchy. Say that again. I say, rhyme rhyme with my head, Sean, smoking on Jamaica. Pray soon as I wake up, got to stay prayed up. You're like, bro, say that again. So when I came home, I was going to put the song in the backfield, but he like, bro, that song is super catchy. You need to record that one. So, you know, the second that I had really heard myself on the vocals and I heard myself like, like Foolish produced it. He's a, a, a producer down in my city that's well known. He's produced tracks for Boosie. He's produced tracks for so many different up and coming artists. And, you know, when I heard the song and he, like, found the beat for it, I'm like, bro, that's my first song I want to record. So that's actually one of the first songs that I recorded after doing my eight and a half year, you know, prison beat. Okay, absolutely. So, man, first off, uh, tell the people where you're from and uh, how old are you? I'm from Lumberton, North Carolina, and I'm 31 years old. Just celebrated a birthday, April the 2nd. All right, happy, happy belated, man. Thank you, big bro. So uh, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear your hometown? Uh, In this time of day, you know, it's a lot of talent. I can't say that. You got artists like Little J-Bo, D-Mac, you know, Glow. You know, like you got a lot of frontline artists like PFK Smooth. And you got a lot of, uh, you know, I don't want to start the name comment because I don't want nobody to feel like I left them out because there's so many different artists that's working. You know, you know, you got like a lot of the younger crowd. You like you got, you know, Day Day. You got uh my little cousin. They call him Bolo. You not man. It's so many different artists that's talent. I feel like if we can just focus more on, you know, getting people and like sitting them together and just chasing a dream and not you know coming out of. You know, coming out of high school in 2023, you feel like you got to have a Benz and 50K in the bank account to be accepted. I feel like if we can get our youth to focus more on, you know, like 
just chasing your dream, man. And you don't have to do all of these things to be accepted. Like I'm telling you, coming back from prison after doing eight and a half years, facing a life sentence, going to trial twice, that you can come back from these things and you don't have to worry about what the crowd say to be accepted. You know, you can just focus on your dream. You know, like, so when it comes to my city, man, I first think of talent because we got a lot of talent. But, you know, we also got a lot of misguidance, you know, with our older brothers that's telling them this thing, those things, bro. Absolutely. I can feel that. So for anybody that never been to your hometown, just kind of describe how I was growing up, everyday kid, you know, uh, some of the struggles you had to go through as a younger kid, a teenager, you know, single parent, household, or anything like that. I mean, I, I, okay, in my situation, I had both of my parents, mom and dad. You know, I think I got, you know, you have the kids that get hit with, you know, feeling like they have to do things to get accepted. And you got the kids that get hit with, you know, feeling like, am I good enough for my friends? Then you got those kids that just get hit with going through life and trying to, you know, be cool. You know, I'm not afraid to say that I went through certain situations trying to be cool. You know, and it's sort of like a daredevil, you know, where people say, man, you won't do that. And I'm the only one out in my crowd that will mostly do a lot of the daredevil stunts. You know, and you know, the days the youth call it crash dummies and all of that. But, you know, if you learn from these things, then you're not a crash dummy. You take what you've been through and bottle it up and, you know, find out that everything ain't what it seems to be on the other side. So, you know, like me growing up in Lumberton, it was wild, man. You know, just because I think most importantly, it's about the energy you put out. So a lot of things that I put out is what made my life the way it did, you know, because I was just, you know, going through these trials, going through these stages of becoming a, you know, an older man. And just was doing a lot of, you know, senseless things, man. And, you know, you know, like Lumberton, where I come from, man, it's just a lot of youth that need better guidance. And I feel like somebody that can teach them is a person that actually been through what they're going through. You know, it's like sort of you saying, like, man, I can't listen to him. He haven't been through what I've been through. But, you know, I'm one of the ones that actually been through what they're going through. So, like, you know, coming up in Lumberton, you know, can vary. It can go from, you know, if you decide to, you know, go the right path, then you can, you know, minimize a lot of the, you know, the side flat that comes from being incarcerated. But if you decide to go down this path, you know, you have to have somebody that's been down that path and that road to tell you, bro, the grass ain't green on the other side because I've been there. That's absolutely, man. So uh, do you got any siblings? Yeah, I got a sister, you know, Shanice Waters. And, you know, like, uh, it's just me and her. You know, I have a lot of brothers and sisters that's connected, you know, connected through. They, it's like they, you know, like, you know how a person uh, feel your struggle. A person will know your story, respect your story. And they say, yo, that's my brother. And yeah, yeah. So I have girls that call me their brother, and then I have, you know, guys that call me their brother. But you know, bloodline speaking, I only have one sister, Shiny Swartz. Okay. So uh what type of activities you was into as a kid? Did you play any sports or anything like that? <sighs> Rapping. I guess we can consider that as a sport. That was I I got YouTube videos when I was like, what, 15? I started rapping at 14, actually. You know, so like I played football one time. I was like, you know, 13, 14 or something like that in my school, uh, Fairgrove Middle. You know, I played football. And, you know, for the most part, it was rapping, putting words together. I was trash at first. But, you know, anything in life, you keep going and you putting the words together, you get better and better in time. So rapping, I guess. Okay. So uh, as far as the uh, music business, did you have anybody growing up uh, as far as friends or family members that was involved in the music business or were you the first one to go down that path? Oh my God. In my city, I think half of my city will vouch for this. If you ask them, I had tattoos at a young age. I had gold teeth. Uh, I was rapping and I was the first one in my city that literally probably did it. 
you know, other than Travis Reed, and I want to say, uh, it was maybe like three of us, bro. You know, like, and that's another topic I want to speak on. People look at rapping as a way to get out of the, which is cool, because we're finding so many different people that got talent. Like, people look at rapping as a way of being able to get out of that dope game, get out of that nine to five. Get out of that uh, uh tough lifestyle because nobody want to get trapped into the matrix. And you know what the matrix is, big bro. Well, you working, you know, consistently hard, 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 hard. We all want to try financial freedom. Nobody wants to get trapped into the matrix. So, you know, like we, a lot of guys that, and that's why I didn't know it was so many talented artists out here when I came home from prison, you know, because I was one of the first ones rapping. I was one of the first ones and everybody like, yo, you know, like, what is he doing? Like, yo, he rapping, but is he really going to take off with it? So, yeah, like, nobody wants to get caught in that nine to five. So, like, in my city, it was me, Travis Reed, and uh, uh, it was, it was like, maybe two or three more, you know, in my city that was just, because everybody thought maybe, oh, man, like, yo, I don't know if that's my trial, if that's what's meant for me, but, like, it's emerged over the course of the years. Absolutely. So uh, if you had to pick a moment, like, what would you say uh, led you to doing music? Uh, Coming home from middle school, putting the words together, when I would get off the bus, I would say, yo, I'm going to take these CDs. I, I still got people from my high school. I went to South Robinson, you know, high school. People that would vouch and tell you that, yo, this guy came to school with CDs. I had CDs in my book set. And I would hand them out. I was making, I was making songs about the principal, and then you know my teacher and my classes. So like you know when I stopped stealing, started realizing like yo, you know I might got something going on here. I kept going. I kept putting the work. Every day I couldn't wait to get off the school bus to get into my home because I built my little studio at the time. You know I couldn't wait to get home to do my little uh you know my little rhyming. So I would write rhymes at school, come home, you know, go into my studio, you know, lock myself in and just make music. Mm -hmm. So uh, who are some of your favorite music artists growing up, who you grew up oh, with? You see how oh, you got that question out there, bro, I already know. People in my city will tell you, well, coming up, you see the tattoos on my face? I had wicks, I had long dreads. My dress was down to here. You know, probably in like 2010, 11, Little Wayne. <laughs> Little Wayne was my biggest artist. Little Wayne, cold heartedly, I was a little. You couldn't tell me I want Little Wayne. I had tech, I had these tattoos on my face since I was fourteen. Little Wayne was one of my biggest inspirations. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, wh where did you get your artist name from? I got okay. I was called Young Leak at first. Then I was called Shy. Now I'm called King. Like when I went through my prison sentence. A lot of people was like, yo, bro, are you going to get another chance? Because I went to trial twice. First time I got, you know, I had a hung jewelry. Second time, and they didn't give me a bomb reduction. They didn't give me an ankle monitor. You know, I pretty much was the fall guy. I pretty much was the guy that they said he did it. Stay, I stayed solid. I didn't, I, you know, I pretty much held 10 toes down. I go back to trial. I win, I win, I lose, I lose. I put my God and my spirit and my faith in you know the courtroom so i was called king shali the second i got released after a second trial i don't know nobody else man that was pretty much in this situation other than little boosie <laughs> that was faced with seven felonies and got found not guilty i was i was charged with murder attempted murder breaking in and entering shooting an occupied dwelling uh, possession of stolen. It was so many different charges. I got found out guilty of all of them. So cool. once I beat my cases, they started calling me a king. And I said, King Shalik was the name that I'm going to go with. Absolutely, man. So go into, um, before we get back on the music, uh, go more into detail on you know the the uh the prison thing like um you know um oh, God. At, what, at what point uh did you get uh did you uh get caught up you know in the in the case that you was in and uh what time frame was that and that just kind of described that whole situation of you you know getting falsely accused you 
having to deal with, you know, sitting in the cell, knowing that you didn't do it and things like that? Uh, 2013 was when I was originally charged. You know, I had what you want to call a bad boy reputation. You know, I was always in and out of trouble. I was in and out of jail. I chose the crowd to be around. Uh, we was labeled bad guys. You know, uh, and I speak to so many different people on a daily basis. They say, Shali, I'll tell your story for you if you don't tell it right. I'll tell your story for you. I say, calm down, bro. You know, it's the time and place for everything. You know, because people want to make sure I get my story out there. You know, like, you know, I was labeled a bad guy. I did a lot of senseless stuff. I hung around a lot of, you know, some of my friends are still in prison. Some of my friends will die in prison. Some of my friends are free today. You know, not many of them. So, you know, coming up, I was just, you know, hanging around different crowds. And, you know, I, you know, was in a place that something happened. And, you know, they said, well, you know, he fits the description. You know, that's Shali. That's who we've been pretty much trying to frame and get a hold to. And we're going to say that he did it. I got locked up. I remained my innocence throughout eight and a half years. Spoke of nothing, you know, other than, you know, me trying to figure out what are we going to do about me getting to trial. And you got rappers that don't even get to trial that have a fair trial. I pray consistently. You know, that was something that I take to the grave with me. You know, about going to trial, literally seeing my mom, my dad, my grandma, my auntie, my uncle, my sister, my cousins, you know, even the victim's family. Watch this trial. I want to come home, but you got a victim family there to feel like we want to hear this case first. And when the case was done, they said, whoa, you know, his lawyer presented enough of, you know, reasonable doubt to why is this guy incarcerated? I said nothing. I was silent. God did the speaking for me. And when God speaks, it don't matter what nobody say here on, you know, earth. You can't outspeak God. So, yeah. Well, absolutely, man. Because, you know, anybody that goes through a situation like that, you know, being stripped of your freedom, you know, having to uh, deal with a a culture shock, you know, uh, me, you know, kind of uh, similar to like a military lifestyle times 10, you know, without having a freedom bar, <laughs> you know, but, but let by certain types of rules, you know, being forced to, you know, because uh, depending on what type of institution you was at, you know, some of it is like set up like slavery in prison. They yes. Have to, have to get up and work every day. They got to, you can't lay around, you know, they, they make you get a job, all type of stuff, man. And I want, big bro, I want to say this because, you know, my, my wife is ex-military like you is like, military ain't easy either. That's, that, it, it, it runs borderline to the prison penitentiary because you're going to get up, you're going to make that bed up, you're going to come out this room and you're going to stay in there. <laughs> you're going, you're going to have some type of discipline and prison learned me discipline. It got its perks and it got its good. You got it cons and it got its pros. Like you gonna get up, you gonna come out that room, you gonna sit in there all day, you gonna exercise, you gonna do something to stimulate your mind, and you gonna either be, you know, you gonna fall waistline. So you know, don't think because I was in prison and a lot of the military, military, you know, like I say, my wife is ex-military and you as well. You know, <laughs> military from what I heard and what I seen is also borderline with you know, being incarcerated. But yeah, man, you know, like, it's like modern day slavery. But my thing about it is everybody that's behind the badge and everybody that has that authority is not, you know, bad. And I say that because I watched the, you know, the looting going on and the shooting and the protesting. Listen, our leaders, I was in prison hoping that I got the voice, hoping that I got the chance to speak like I am today to let my youth know that, yo, just because a person is white, what about the biracial kids? What about, you know, everybody that's white is not racist. You have to get to know a person. 
before you automatically point a finger and say that they're racist. You know, you got biracial children. You know, like you have to know the person. My attorney that fought my case that got me found not guilty was white. If he had any racist malice in his heart, shit, I excuse my language, but I probably wouldn't be here today because he'd have threw me out and said, you know, I'm going to sell him out. But you got to realize, like, people that got these, but it's our leaders. Our leaders that got these positions of power don't speak. If I make a rap and you hear my rap and you say, yo, is he capping or telling the truth? Ask me. I tell you if I'm capping. I tell you if I'm saying it for entertainment. Or I tell you if I'm saying it to be, you know, uh, uh, down for the music. I tell you that. And I don't care if you listen or not. I'm going to tell you the truth. If I tell you that's what I've been through, bro, that's what I've been through. If I tell you that I'm saying that to get, yeah, I'm saying that for your entertainment. Absolutely. So you being removed from prison, you know, eight and a half years, you know, beating the case and things like that. Uh, when you look back on it, you know, uh, as you get older, you know, you become more reflective on your life when you start, you know, getting up in age. So when you uh, look back on that, that period of your life, I, I had to imagine that that was probably – uh, uh, the roughest time of your life. What um, uh, what would you take from it and um take from the situation uh positive wise, and um, do you um, yeah 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 I can, I, I forgot the second part, but what what would you what what would you what would it's you cool, take, bro, we, we, take from the situation? You know, God is God is leading this right now. So, you know, it's coming from your heart. That's why, you know, my wife said, yo, hi, big bro. I said, we're going to follow the heart. You know, that's what's leading this, God and spirit. What I could take from my situation and positively wise, like I tell you, I learned discipline in prison. I learned how to save. I learned how to hold my composure. There's nothing. When me going through what I went through is what I needed to become a better man. I can't argue with, I can't argue with, I sacrificed a lot, you know, you know, calling the phone, you have to hear about, you know, your women moving on, you know, finding different guys, but would you rather that? Or would you rather coming home in wholeness, coming home with your sanity, coming home better than you ever been? It's a sacrifice. You get nowhere without sacrifice. Everything positive that I learned from prison, I wouldn't change it. I, I can't argue with what I've been through. I can't, you know, fuss with the positive things I've learned. It's no argument. Like God did. God did what I needed him to do to become the man I am today. So whatever I dealt with that was bad, that I thought was bad, I'm not mad with it. Everything that I gained out of this that was positive, my discipline, my knowledge, my wisdom, my patience, my understanding, I'm satisfied today with it. Absolutely. And that, uh, that reminds me of a time frame uh, in my life, you know, when I, uh, uh, as far as military, me going through a divorce and things like that, that was probably the roughest time of my life. And a lot of people ask me all the time, you know, like, do you uh, miss the military or do you regret going in the military? Because a lot of people know me for, like, playing sports and things like that in high school. So they was like, but uh, the same reasons that you gave for prison, I tell people all the time that I'm thankful for the military because, you know, like when I see friends that I hang around that doesn't have – uh, that discipline and things like that, and and it's nothing. There's no knock against them, you know, because everybody got different paths in life. But I just feel like, you know, uh, me personally, uh, me being able to go in the military at 18 years old, learning discipline, having to learn about credit, having to learn how to just basically make grown up decisions at a at a young age. I was like, uh. And uh, appreciating the small things in life, you know, because, you know, me going to Afghanistan twice made me appreciate the smallest things in life. Like some people might, you know, 
brush over certain things, but like I'll be thankful for just being able to go to the drive through and get a burger. I know I remember a time in the military, I couldn't even, wasn't able to eat what I wanted to eat because I'm right. in the See? See? You know? yeah. So we share similarities, definitely, man. You know, like, and uh, you know, my ex wife, like, you know, excuse my wife, this ex military is what I meant to say, like, you know, like she tells me, you know, like, you know, she served the time and you know, she get good benefits you know, for being military. And like, you know, she told me it was it was times to where she couldn't do this, couldn't do that, and she had discipline. Discipline is one of the solid keys that you need for a solid foundation. If you don't got discipline, oh man. And you can acquire that discipline from military, prison, or whatever God puts you through to read that discipline. Because if you don't got discipline, you don't know how to take $100 and save it. You know, people to take a hundred dollars and say, "Well, I'm gonna spend all, all this money, and next week I'm gonna get some more." But then you got those ones that say, "I'm gonna take this hundred dollars. I'm gonna spend fifty dollars. Then I'm gonna have fifty. Then I'm gonna get another hundred next week. And that's gonna be a hundred. I'm gonna put to the side discipline. Whether it's sacrifice and discipline is a major key to a solid foundation. If you don't got that, it don't matter how much money you get because you're not gonna have enough discipline to keep it. Yeah. This. Yeah, man. So uh, take me back to the time when you went to a record studio for the first time. Just uh, kind of run me through that process. Was it was it a uh, kind of a rough process for you to catch on recording, or did you catch on easy? First of all, you know, my mom was like, "What are you doing?" Because I took the closet in my room and padded it up with bed sheets when it was thick bed sheets with the cover and she's like yo what are you doing i'm like mama i'm making a recording book she's like well what is a recording book? i'm like mom she's like man all right whatever whatever you do that's cool all right so the first actually studio that i was in homemade studio was my home my bedroom you know uh i went and just like you know, was trying to figure out So I didn't know what I was doing. I guess I was guided by God's spirit. So I'm like, I'm nailing the little, the little pins into the walls in my closet and I take the door handle and move it off and run the cord from the laptop into the little, the door handle to where it go into the mic, which was inside of my closet. So I'm recording like, yeah, I had people come over there like, I don't know about this, bro, but, you know, like, we ain't seen too many people do this, but all right, cool. So, man, you know, like, the first time I actually recorded was at my home. And the process, you know, now that I look back on it, you know, like I said, I have YouTube videos to where I started. You know, it's just like a growing, I'm, I'm able to say that I have that documented. That's why I'd be so glad when, I don't care if it's three people in the club. If I see my cameraman, which is D-Wise, shout out to D-Wise. You know, if I tell you guys, yo, come out, man, this is dinosaur material, meaning that once we're dead and gone, which we're all going to transition, my kids, kids, kids will be able to see this. So I documented my first, you know, me in my home recording, you know, doing music. So now today, like 16 years later, I can go and look at that. So like I say, man, it was a good process because it was at my home and I was just experimenting and, you know, Things just came so natural. Absolutely. So as far as your process, are you more of a writer or a freestyler or is it like a mixture of both? Both. I can freestyle. I wrote raps. Like I got videos right there for females, you know, where I wrote their raps, you know, and then I got, uh, you know, my own music the way I write. So I'm pretty much, uh, you know, just uh, I'm both. A freestyler, writer. I could be a ghost writer. You know, a mixture of everything. Because I could touch every topic from prison, being free, you know, recording, you know, being through the trials and the tribulations, being in the streets. You know, I pretty much could touch every topic other than jumping off a building and flying. Literally. So if you, so if you had to pick a moment, what would you say is the moment that, uh, that you knew that you could uh, pursue music seriously? <sighs> You know, when we're young and we don't take it serious right then and there, you know, we're like just sort of scattered out all over the place, like trying to figure out, is this for me? 
or is that should I go to the streets because the money is slow? I don't see no money in this. I need to find a way to make this work, trying to find a way to make this capitalize. So I battle with that. You know, even today, even today, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't see this working out, so I'm going to quit. I don't see this working out, so I'm going to just put it on the back burner. So I still gamble with, I'm not saying that I gamble with making, taking it serious or not, you know, but we gamble sometimes with how long is this going to take or do I really got it? It's no doubt in my mind that I, you know, got it or not, I got it. It's just a matter of how long and when I capitalize. So, you know, after I came home from prison, I feel like since so young and I feel like I had it. I feel like I could capitalize off of it, but it's always, and I think for some of us still, it's a matter of when and how long and what are we going to have to go through to get here. It's never a question of, is this for me or not? My prison sentence, my story, you know, my passion, my glory, this is for me. So, you know, the more I would say more of today, I'm just in that mind state, but it's nothing to worry about me steering left and getting off track. So I feel like today I'm, I could take it more serious than ever because of my story. Absolutely. So you being an independent artist, uh, would you sign to a major if it made sense? I'm sort of like, I have a few managers, but I'm sort of like one of those artists that listen and I hear a lot of the, what they call 360 deals and a lot of, uh, you know, management. I would feel like uh, it would be more of me still trying to figure out what's been, I let my managers consult, but I still have a say so, but I wouldn't be too big on just signing a deal without reading a fine print. <laughs> without the little fine print. Before I sign anything, but yeah, man, you know, I'm looking to find, you know, like, I feel like most importantly, you know, God got this. So what's set out for us, you know, we can't hide it. We can't deny it. God's going to find, you know, no blessing. My blessing is for me and your blessing is for you. So however God finds his way to, you know, get to me in that situation, if that's what's for me, I get it. Absolutely. So as far as your process right now, man, how often are you going to the studio and record these days? Today, big bro, my wife will tell you, I'm in there heavy. <laughs> At one point in time, because I was working a nine to five, because, you know, when we come home from prison, you know, we got to be ready. We got to be ready to, you know, attack this thing called life because you got those people, those critics that will look at you and say, oh, he's only going to be out six months. He's only going to be out two weeks. He's only going to be out two days. You got those type of critics. So I went to work and I worked the nine to five. My hands was in the cold. I, I know what that's like. You know, that's not nothing that nobody told me. That's not nothing that, that I think. That's something I know. I went and, you know, I worked the nine to five. So today I'm full music. Everything is music. So I go to the studio maybe three times out the week, you know, whenever I get that feel. I might wake up out of my sleep and tell my wife I'm going to the studio. I got something in my head. So it's not like, oh, I got to wait till I get off work. And, you know, we still battle with how can we escape the matrix. We still battle how can we make ends meet. So, you know, my wife that come into my life because I'm engaged, she helped me figure a lot of this out. She's a piece to the puzzle. You know, I had to, you know, I had to get up to this far without her, but she makes it better to be able to, okay, you know, the world wasn't meant for you to go at it alone. You know, no matter what, no matter how you feel, you have to have that significant other or somebody to tackle the world for you. Or with you is what I meant to say, excuse me, with you. So you can go at this world together. So she helps me. And, you know, I go to the studio a lot now, you know, more than I was going when I was working nine to five, because obviously I was, you know, working real hard. Absolutely. So take me back to the time, man, when you first dropped your music out for the first time to the public. 
how did the, uh, was the city embracing you around that time when they was able to hear your music for the first time? It's sad to say this. People that know me know. Some people was like, do we still got it? We know he got the story. We know Shali. But let's listen to his music. I wasn't getting embraced just yet. I had to recreate myself. I had to recreate my music. Because the times changed. I did eight and a half years. When I left, it was people that was like this, that's like this now, that's rapping. So they come like, yo, you got to respect me first before you get in here. I know who you is. I know your story. But, yo, you got to, you, we got to see what you got before we allow you. And that's them. I already knew I was a goat. That's the Puff Daddy mind state. Mind state the Jay-Z mind state. You know, the, the billionaire mind state. Well, I don't, I don't care about what you think or say. I'm going to be me. You know? The tattoos on my face, listening to Lil Wayne at a young age, wearing the skinny jeans. I'm going to be me. I'm going to be comfortable in my skin. and I'm going to be content whether you like it or not. So come in. They didn't just embrace me. They knew who I was. I had to work for this. Still, after coming home from, you know, two trials to being able to have a, you know, a, a solid story, I still had to work for this, big bro. And anything in life worth having, you got to work for. Whether you got to work over and over for it. So that's fine for me. Because this just add on to my story, big bro, my legacy. Absolutely. So uh, have you done any shows yet? Uh, that's the thing that I'm working on because my manager, he's out in Atlanta. And he's like, yo, before I put you in a show, I want to make sure that, you know, he's just so much of we strategically making moves now. We sit back and we do a lot of social media. We do. A, and what I mean by that, we do a lot of, you know, connecting with management and different people from, you know, across the world. From uh, I've been dealing with a few people in Atlanta. You know, I've been dealing with a few people in like, uh, you know, Detroit area. And, you know, like we got a few links down in Houston. But like far as me getting up moving just yet, we're, we're strategically calculating my steps. Only because, you know, it's just like one of them things. Because now in 2023, you know, social media made it to where you can just do this and reach a lot. Like I got a lot of fans in Nigeria. Like in Nigeria, from being in <laughs> United States, so like you know, uh, I haven't done too many shows, but I feel like once I get to where I need to be at, it's going to be epic. You know, it's going to be great. It's not going to. It's going to be good. I know it. Absolutely, man. So, uh, for anybody that ain't never been to your city, man, describe the music scene in your city. And oh. also describe, you know, the local artists there. Do they collab or do we they, got do their own thing? First person I can say to change the game, and this I give people their flowers. Little Jabo. You know, a lot of people don't like giving people their flowers, man. Like, I don't wanna like everybody's not cut the same though. Little Jabo, he did a track with Little Boosie, he's did a track with Big 30, he's collaborated with uh young Ro, a young uh I want to say he's out of Fayetteville. You know, he did tracks with so many different artists. D Mac, he works hard. You know, he hasn't had too many big features, but he's one of the hardest working artists in North Carolina. I want to say Dollar Hunter, he's had links with Lucci. You know, uh, I want to say my little cousin Bolo, he's out of Fairmount, North Carolina. You know, he works hard. Uh, you got uh, TSN 9. They were, it's so many different three-letter groups. You got BMG Hondo. Like, a lot of people works hard. And, you know, he's tied to, like, I, I, I got connections to all of these guys because I came up in the streets. So all of these guys, man, need to get their flowers while they are here. You know, even if they don't, you know, not them, but just in particular, people don't want to give me my flowers. I give those guys their flowers because they're trying hard. You know, it's just a lot of young and up-and-coming hungry artists, and they find this as a way to be free because, you know, we don't want to work hard. We want to work smart. We don't want to work those excessive hours for, you know, truth be told, a little bit of nothing. You got OnlyFans models that make $300 a day. When I was working at Smithville, Purdue, and Mountain Air Chicken Plants, 
I couldn't make no more than one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars a day, even with overtime. Maybe two fifty. You got only fans models that make three hundred. I mean, it each is on. It's so many different ways to generate currency. We just have to find it the legal, legit way. So yeah, man, there's so many different hungry artists. Absolutely, man. So uh, uh, this is a question I just started asking people, um, especially artists. Uh, do you believe rappers are being targeted now, or well, we're just artists in general? Yes, only because because they lie. Some of them lie without telling the truth behind it. <laughs> if I'm gonna tell you a lie, you gotta be. I gotta be ready for it. You got, and I don't mean it in no bad way. Right? You got artists. They make it like that. I mean. Most of the successful, talented artists are African American. You got some Europeans, but they, I mean, even if you want Luther King, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman, Stokely Carmichael, you still will be targeted. So, like, with that being said, they are targeted. They are. And, you know, uh, it also makes some people scared to be rappers, but I mean, like, at the end of the day, we're all going to die. We're all going to transition. We're all going to make that. So let's let's be the better versions of ourselves. So with the voices that you have, tell the truth. Don't mislead the youth and tell them things because our people are frowned upon only because they feel like we can't unite. We can't conjugate. We can't speak on topics and come together. You know, we got to break generational curses. We target ourselves sometimes. Yes, we can be targeted and some people going to die with racism on their heart, but what about the biracial children? So, yes, we are targeted in a sense, but I can just speak about myself and those that are trying to better this world. You know, you got so many critics. People say, oh, you do this, you do that. Man, you got people arguing back and forth about a blue check. You got people arguing about different things, man. Like, bro, let critics be critics and you do what makes you happy. So if a person is here to break a generational curse, whether they are targeted or not, when they die, like Nipsey Hussle, they will be put in that light of a person trying to change. Nipsey Hussle. He's one of the ones. He may have been targeted as an artist. He may have. We don't know. But his legacy will live forever because he tried to do something to better the youth. And that's how I want to die. So regardless, I'm targeted or not. Can't nobody change me. And this is just what it is. Absolutely. I can feel that, bro. So as far as uh, collabs, man, kind of list some artists that you, uh, that you work with so far and list some artists that you want to work with in the future. Uh, like my thing about a lot of people been speaking to me about features, you know, like uh, a lot of my local artists have been saying, yo, let's collab. But like, you know, in this time of day, as far as mainstream artists, I would like to work with Drake, of course, Lil Wayne, uh, you know, Lil Baby, uh, Future, and Yo Got It. You know, it's a lot of different people like I'm versatile. I believe in like to work with uh, Puff, Puff Daddy. You know, they're critics about Diddy. Jay-Z, even if they don't touch the track, as long as they produce it, Kanye, you know, but, you know, a lot of local artists around my way is, you know, like, yo, let's feature, but, like, my thing about it is, like, I'm super introvert, like, at times, I'm an introvert, I don't like going around different people, I go and record myself and, and have a secret location, not even let people know I'm recording, and just push it to them over the email, so, you know, I, uh, I'm looking to collab with a lot of different artists in the future, you know, but I, I you know, Right now, I've just been trying to focus on downpacking my sound, downpacking my, uh, you know, perfecting my vocals, perfecting my, you know, my hooks and different things. So I'm sort of like, I'm not being self-centered, but I've been trying to figure out my voice before I just jump out of you. Because, you know, you got different topics. So I'm looking to collab with a lot of mainstream artists and also local artists, but I'm just not rushing into nothing and taking my time. Yeah, I can feel that. Everything's is a process. So uh, for all your fans out there, man, uh, uh, list some things you like doing in your spare time when you're not doing music. 
Woo! Number one is work out. As soon as I wake up, me and my wife go to the gym. Work out, eat us an apple, or rather, you know, something healthy, and coffee, and then go straight to push-ups. And that's discipline, too. Because, you know, uh, it's not always about the outside. It's about inside. You got people that fix their bodies, but nobody fix their souls. That's a big quote that's going around. My wife posted that as well. Let's fix our soul first or fix our, you know, our body and soul in the process. Because I don't care how you look on the outside. If your personality screwed up, you still, you know, you still ain't perfect. I hate to meet a person that's nice on the outside, but inside their personality is screwed up. So like I said, I like exercising. Uh, and then I make a positive quote. You know, either I'm laying in the bed and saying something positive or either I'm recording it. That's how I like to get my day started. You know, workout, coffee, apples, and, you know, uh, positive quotes. Okay. Uh, so uh, what are your short and long-term goals? What do you want to accomplish? Uh, My long-term goals is, you know, I think it's most of our long-term goals, you know, being financially free. You know, being to the point where I can wake up and say, I don't have to worry about how this is going to work. How to, without, because we got a lot of people that do that that's illegally making ends meet. I don't want to look over my shoulders. I've been through that. I want to legally, legitly, completely reach financial freedom. So, you know, my short term goes, I would say, you know, if push come to show, I go back. I throw, you know, work the graveyard shift nine to five. I mean, I did it before three times. I got to do that. I got to do that. The long term goes is being wealthy, financially free. To the point where I don't have to worry about looking over my shoulder, worrying about the police kicking in my wife's door, kicking in my door, or raiding my car, pulling me over. You know, have to go to prison and see my kids being raised by another guy that's not their father. So, I mean, that's just it, big bro. Like, I'm here now. My spiritual and third eye is open, and can't nobody shut it. Absolutely. So, 2023, man, what you got coming for 2023, man? Oh, man. Um, well, you got that out your mouth, big bro. I can't help. Yo, I got a ton of videos coming, a ton of interviews, like, uh, just work, 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 work. How Rihanna say, work, 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 work. You got uh, you know, um, to mention the book, too, man. You said something about Oh, yeah, that. yeah. I'm working on a documentary about, you know, just coming up as a child, you know, just, uh, because the Bible says that if you don't get to save everybody, that one can save that one and that one can save that one. It's like a that one can save that one. It's like a, a chain reaction. So like I'm just I have a book, a documentary that we're going to try to, you know, focus on, you know, getting on Netflix and then I have the book speaking about, you know, basically going to trial twice. First time having a hung jury, then not getting a bomb reduction, and then not getting an ankle monitor, having to sit in jail another two years until you go back to trial. I was incarcerated in 2013. I didn't come home in 2022. But I went to trial in 2019 and got, you know, had a hung jury. Then being held after that, sent back to the cell, People in my ear, take a plea, take a plea, don't go back to trial, you're going to lose, you're going to lose, you're going to die in prison. If you go back to trial, to me balling it up and praying and going back to trial and being found not guilty of all cases. So my documentary and my book is going to speak on that and then just speak on just about every, you know, from the dealers to the realists, the billers, you know, to even the, the attorneys, to even the, you know, the people in prison. Like, I have so much to talk about that I'm going to put in my book. So I have a book coming up and a documentary that we're working on, you know, right now. And it's going to be riddled with so much, you know, so much things that our people can relate to. Okay. So as far as this, another question that I had too, because this was kind of curious to me. So I know a lot of people that get wrongly convicted, especially if they had to spend years in time, usually the state, uh, usually have to pay them for them giving part of their life 
in prison because they wasn't supposed to be there. So in your situation, did that ever come about, like them saying, hey, like, you know, he wasn't supposed to be in prison, like, we go get him this money, you know, because you've seen a lot of situations when people staying in jail 20, 30 years, and then they find out that they ain't do it, and then they have to pay him all that money. I have an attorney that you may buy, may not, excuse me, I have an attorney that you may know that go by the name of, uh, when I speak of him, you know, Benjamin Crump. I'm going to just say his name. I was hesitating because Benjamin Crump don't like being, you know, he, he likes to attack. When he go public, he go public. Benjamin Crump is my attorney fighting this case. You familiar with Ben Crump, right? No, I don't know who that is. Okay, Ben Crump is a civil rights activist. Ben Crump, he helped in the Breonna Taylor case. Okay. He also helped in the George Floyd case. He's African American. He's aware of my situation. And he's been, you know, connecting the dots because we're fighting for a civil suit. I don't want to, and we, you know, certain things that we really, and it's sad because we don't want to be targeted. We don't want to be, you know, picked out and pulled over because we speaking all these type of things. But yes, I have a few lawyers that's looking over this case that says I have a a civil suit. Yeah. You know, but I don't I don't want to be targeted by the just let me get what's rightfully mine. And you know, we're gonna leave that at that, big bro. That because you know, you know, we don't wanna be targeted for what's right. <laughs> and it's sad. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's the uh, first thing that I uh, thought about uh, when I read the article on online. I was like, "Hey, I wonder is he doing this?" You know. Yeah. Yep. But uh, uh, this is kind of a legacy question right here. So, uh, how do you want people to perceive you? You know, when I'm dead and gone, they don't wear that. It don't matter whether I make two million, two dollars, two hundred thousand. I want people to take my story and just look at it and say that a man can be beat physically, mentally, spiritually. He can be beat. He can be counted out. He can have a foot, an elbow, or ten people on his neck. He can go to trial twice. He can have tattoos on his face and he can be African-American and come all the way back from all of that and be a better man than he has ever been. I also want him to know that you can go to prison for murder, attempt to murder, and then do a thing just by your past and stay firm and solid and believe in God and he'll set you free. You can come back from all of that, man, and be, you know, you don't have to worry about being accepted. You can come back from all of that and change your life and still be accepted in the eyes of the rightful ones in God and change people's lives. That's, that, that's all it is for me. Absolutely, man. I think a lot of this, uh, this interview will resonate with a lot of people that's that uh that been through something, especially if you uh ever hit rock bottom. I know everybody rock bottom might be different than certain people rock bottom. Somebody rock bottom might be, you know, going to prison. Some people rock bottom might be, you know, car getting repossessed or divorce or whatever, whatever case may be, you know. Anybody can uh Especially anybody that's a a regular uh, nine to five working person can relate to uh, anybody that had to go through the struggle because anybody had to go through some type of struggle in their life at some point, whether it was financially or whether it was personally with family or whatever the case might be. Yes. And it's an honor 
And I'm grateful for Big Bro for you to be allowed me. It's like a piece of that puzzle. It don't matter if you just one piece. You gotta have the rest of the puzzle to, to, to go together to make it complete. You're a piece of the puzzle for me, bro. For me being able to, you know, put it here in my puzzle and try to complete my image. Complete that that image of that puzzle being put together. So I thank you. And you know, that's what I want to do, man, is just inspire others. You know, because it's not all about money for me. It's not these chains, these rings, that's obsolete now. It don't take that to be accepted. Anybody can put on a chain to be accepted. You know, you know the cold, hard facts of discipline just through being in the military. You know, discipline, discipline. They look at us and think that we, you know, just have it easy or like discipline, man. You can never look like me or you. They can never look at us and see what we've been through. You know, so that's what it's about for me, man. You know, being able to tell my story to the world and just spark the lights of others. You know, just like a revolutionary. You know, just like some of our people that left marks on the world. You know, the biggies, the Nipsey Hussles, the Tupacs, you know, the Stokely's, Carmichael, the Nelson Mandela, you know, Marcus Garvey. The list goes on. That's it. Absolutely, man. I can feel that. Uh, give me your Mount Rushmore, man. Uh, give me your top five influential people to your life. It could be famous people. It could be family. Yeah, I'm going because I'm going revolutionary now. I don't want to. Number one is ah, Martin Luther King. <laughs> you know, because and I'm a, can I say why? Martin Luther King was hosed down with waters. I read his story in uh, Malcolm X's story. He was hosed down with water. He was a uh, beat. He mastered the state of meditation from Mahandas Gandhi, which is an uh, Egyptian Indian meditation goddess. Martin Luther King, not even say that I would turn my cheek in certain ways, but I see why him and Malcolm deferred. Because one wanted it, but one wanted this and the other wanted this, but I feel like Malcolm was more aggressive when it was time, and Martin Luther King will let God do his fighting for him. They both was remarkable historical men. You know, Martin Luther King won, and I also read the story of uh, Muhammad Ali and Elijah Muhammad. So I would say, you know, I want to get my Martin Luther King is one. Number two, I would say it's Malcolm X. You know, and he rides, you know, him and him and him and Elijah Muhammad is both number two, because I can't say one without the other. So uh, and then, you know, number three, my artist is, you know, I don't want to mix it up. So I wish I could give five, you know, five revolutionaries and five artists. So I just say Drake and Little Wayne. But, you know, my number one, two is my revolutionaries, my brothers that fought for, you know, something. Whether people thought they fought for nothing or fought just because they couldn't agree on something, they still fought for something. And, you know, they contribute to some type of freedom that we have today. Martin, Malcolm, Elijah. So whatever their differences was, that's, I'm not the critics. But I know they fought for something that we're able to be able to speak of today. Absolutely, man. I can feel that, man. So close the remarks, man. Uh, anything that you want to let the people know that you got going on, anything else you want to uh, say to the people and uh, let people know how to keep up with you on social media and things. Yeah. Like my Instagram is at K-I-N-G King and my name Shali S-H-I-L-E-C King Shali uh, you know and also when you go there you'll be able to find my Facebook. You can follow me there and, you know, uh, pretty much, you know, I want to shout out to my family, my wife and big bro for having me, having me, Eric J. the Great. And, you know, I have my book, my documentary, and I'm in the studio a lot. And, you know, just follow me and stay posted because, you know, I'm one of those guys that let God 
plan things for me. I'll plan a little bit, but I don't plan too much because, you know, sometimes nothing goes planned. God is in control of my steps. Spirit is in control of what I do and what I don't do. And I just have to continue to stay prayed up. So, you know, I have, you know, documentary, you know, my book. And, you know, I'm looking to work with new artists and travel. And, you know, uh, I have a new single called On God that's out. And, you know, I'm going to do a video on that soon. And you can also Google me and my name, Shalik. S-H-I-L-E-C. And then the rest will come up. You know, you can read about my case online. And, you know, that's pretty much it, big bro. I love you and thank you so much, man, for this opportunity. I'm honored and grateful. Right, no problem, man. Uh, anytime, man. You know, anytime you want to come on the uh, podcast, you come on anytime, record. Uh all days of the week, you know, just uh randomly uh uh happens, you know, just like you know, my auntie uh tag tagging you in my comments on my Facebook, you know. <laughs> That's how thank I you, man. Yeah. yeah, and you know, big brother and Jay the Great man, you know, interview Freeway Ricky and interview Little Flip, man. Let's give him his flowers while you're here, man. You know, he done interviewed a lot of different good artists, man. It got me feeling good, man. He's in you know, he's interviewing me now. You know, who's to say what happens next for us or him together? Me, uh, us as a whole. You know, shout out to Eric J. the Great, man. You know, tap in for your interview, man. Yeah, absolutely, man.